Welcome to our Block 6 CC conversation. During Block 5, we learned about projects celebrating the Block's plan's 50th anniversary. For this conversation, we're joined by Associate Professor of Education, Manu Whitaker, and Vice Provost and Associate Professor of Economics, Pedro de Araujo. We're looking forward to chatting about how the Block Plan has enabled flexibility amidst the ongoing pandemic. For those watching who might not know about these changes, Pedro, can you describe a normal CC academic schedule and the changes we've implemented this year? Eight blocks versus 10. Explain the change to the sliding 10 block year. And when you have a chance, could you just give us some numbers concerning our current enrollment? Do my best, President Edmonds. Um, we uh, so thanks for having me here. First of all, you know I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so CC, if you think about the block plan regularly, right? What you have is a sequence of eight blocks, right? So you students take four blocks in the fall, four blocks in the spring, right? We end our year by May. And then there's sometimes an opportunity for a student to take half a unit during January, right? So, so if you think about that, our regular academic year is comprised of 8.5 blocks, but most likely eight, right? And that's that's a traditional academic year. With the pandemic, you know, last year, one of the things that we were fortunate to have this particular uh, uh, academic plan was that we wanted to try to give students the opportunity to still be able to take a minimum of eight blocks per year, right? And try to figure out a way, right? For them to potentially start later, right? And still take eight blocks or start in the beginning of the fall and then maybe take the winter blocks off if they, if they choose to do so, but still continue to be able to make progression towards the degree. Uh, and then the other piece that we were trying to do to is try to figure out a way to allow students to potentially take more than eight blocks, but still pay for eight, right? So, so the, the idea then was to think of the, the academic year uh, between blocks one in the fall, all the way to block C in the summer, and also adding an entire unit in January, which before used to be half units, right? We were able to put a one unit there. So when you count that, you have 12 blocks now that starts in the fall, and ends in, in the summer, in August. And then students then can choose out of the 12 blocks, 10 blocks, yeah. right, for, uh, uh, for that same tuition price, right? And they could be taken it in any order. So for example, right, students could start the year in block four, right, and still, right, uh, uh, in theory, be able to finish eight units of coursework, right? So that has been really the main the main difference, right, between the two things. And I still encourage students, if you think about it, right, right now we are still in block six, right, which is like the beginning of the second half of the 12 blocks, right? So students still have the opportunity to, even if you've taken two units so far, to still complete your entire academic year, right, if you enroll for courses, right, between now and block C. Uh, in terms of enrollments, it's been interesting because we we I won't uh, we thought that we would see a decrease in enrollments, right? Based on COVID, I think a lot of institutions of higher education thought that this was going to be the case, and some actually did feel uh, uh, enrollments. In our case, we were uh, pretty steady, uh, so we capped typically for fall and spring on a per block basis about 1,900 students and en fully enrolled, right, in in these blocks, which is a little shy of what we typically see in a regular year. Uh, for summer, of this particular summer, we already we already have uh, around 800 students enrolled, uh, and that number is probably going to grow. Uh, this is already a 30% increase if you think about a regular uh, summer offering. So this is kind of telling us that our sliding scale is kind of working and students are taking advantage of it. But there are still spots available, so students should still register. So learning 
in a virtual setting is both new and challenging for students and our professors. So Manya, could you talk about how faculty have managed to provide a quality liberal education in this new environment and maybe describe some of the benefits and challenges that have come from the new learning platform? Absolutely, President Moore, and thank you all for having me. I'm always excited to talk about teaching and learning as an education professor. So one of the main benefits of going virtual, of course, is mitigating the spread of coronavirus, right? I think we've been successful in that endeavor. But just as Pedro was describing the benefits of our new schedule for students, faculty have had the same benefits of spreading our uh, teaching out across all of these blocks as opposed to trying to get it all done within eight blocks. So we generally teach six out of the eight blocks. So now we can teach six out of 12 blocks, which also has given us a ton of flexibility, which we've needed as we thought through how to transition from fully in person to in some cases like mine to fully virtual. Um, and that what, one of the main benefits of doing that was even though I got to maintain my small classes, I also got to expand what we were engaging in. So many of my faculty members and myself uh, develop vast uh, new te uh, technological skills. We've had to really be innovative with our teaching um, and take advantage of our ITS and their support um, in helping us learn how to deliver what we normally would do in person virtually. Um, and really it's pushed us to think more holistically about students' needs so that we truly are centering equity in our decision-making. Whereas in person, we can kind of go through things in a little bit of a flexible manner. Now we have to be much more intentional to make sure that students are all receiving a high quality liberal arts education. That said, um, there have been some difficulties, um, some challenges here, most of which are logistical. Um, many of our students live around the globe. Um, and so we've had to really figure out how to have class so that everyone can attend even those students who maybe are caregivers for others in their family, who are um, taking on jobs or internships, or who they themselves may not have been feeling the best. Um, and so we've really been uh, successful at addressing this by letting go of our traditional nine to 12 meeting schedule. Um, I've shifted my class to start at 10 or 10.30. Um, we sometimes take a break in the middle and come back for an hour after having two hours. Um, I also have created many asynchronous sessions so that if a student misses class, um, they can either have a recorded session that we uh, can, can, can upload, or there's an asynchronous option as well. Um, and so I think the, the second logistical barrier was about getting students the learning materials that they needed. We usually have a campus bookstore where students can go if they're not ordering, um, they can get their text. Um, but even now with COVID, we know that our mailing systems kind of collapsed and were really slow. And so students couldn't even really order text. So Many of the faculty have expanded what counts as a text now. Um, and so I've started to integrate things like TED Talks, YouTube videos, Khan Academy, um, things that students can access no matter where they are in the world. And the, there's less of a reliance now on those hardcore tangible texts. Um, and so curating a curriculum that is, that is accessible um, is, has been a challenge, but definitely something that I'm happy I can then take forward when we return in person in the fall. Thank you so much, Professor Whitaker. I would like to hear from both of you, what, what can we do as an institution or what is being done to support our faculty and staff during the pandemic and during this extended teaching um, and learning time frame? And you all know, uh, we've had no spring break. This would be uh, our spring break time. But so I would just love to hear from both of you, what are some of the things that we're doing that support both the teaching and learning efforts during this pandemic? Oh, I, I can take on the student piece and then maybe Professor Whitaker can talk a little bit about the, the faculty piece of this. But um, uh, one of the I guess one of the things that we've we've been doing is what we've been doing even before COVID. That is, all of our student support services are still open and functioning, uh, uh, right? So, so really, the uh, the ability of students to be able to get that academic support, either for example via the writing center or the quantitative reasoning center, right, uh, um, or or anything else, all of those services. 
they're available. The difference is that just like classes, right? They are being delivered, right? And a lot of it in, in a remote format, right? Which our students are very uh, uh, adaptable, right? And in fact, some of them are like that, that situation where they can uh, um, engage with a tutor, for example, or engage with a, with a writing center specialist, right? Uh, uh, from their own homes, right? Even if they're not on campus, which in the past uh, uh, was more of a challenge, right? Because we were not used to this particular uh, uh, situation, right? So uh, the, all of the services are not only our accessibility resources services continues to uh, 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 to work with students, right? That that have the, that 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 have needs in terms of accommodations and so forth, right? A lot of those processes have been automated. Our registrar's office is the same thing, right? So students can still reach our registrar's office, you know, via email or a phone call. Uh, and and most of the most of the transactions that they need in terms of classes can be done now virtually, right? So so a lot of those a lot of those uh, efforts haven't been. Uh, uh, I think actually enhanced, you know, by actually the pandemic, because we have to had to figure out a way to keep the same level of 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 support, right, without really uh, um, allowing students not to be on campus. Uh, our student opportunities and advising hub has been uh, pretty much communicating with. A handful, a lot of students on a daily basis, right? Where they ask for a lot of questions about our schedules, a lot of you know help in terms of connecting them to other resources. Uh, uh, and again, they they are doing this uh, uh, virtually, right? So uh, um, when we talk to students about this, uh, the response so far has been very positive, right? In terms of. Uh, uh, of course, they, they want to be on campus. They want that community, right? They want to be able to do this. But in terms of what they are receiving from the college as support, uh, they see a lot of positives and they actually hope that we can continue to deliver, right? Some of these support services this way as we go back, right? To, to potentially fully in person, you know, next fall. Yeah, and on the students, I mean, excuse me, on the faculty side, um, we've had lots of support from the institution as well. Um, and so we've had uh, technological support, I mentioned from ITS, but also from the advising hub they have, as Pedro said, taken on a bulk of the work that faculty genuinely do in person when students pop by our office and say, hey, Manya, can you help me think through my classes? The students know now after consistent messaging that it's more efficient and more effective if they utilize the advising hub. Um, and so that's kind of a, a, a backwards support that the faculty have now, freeing us up from a lot of advising that takes a significant amount of time. Um, a year ago, when we first transitioned, ITS put on dozens of workshops and webinars to help us learn how to navigate these new platforms. They continue to respond amazingly quickly when we have questions about any of these applications that we're using as extensions to Canvas. I think pedagogically, our Crown Center has done a really good job of hosting workshops um, on teaching in this format and teaching in an anti-racist way in this format as well. And then I think with respect to kind of the faculty well-being, that is a support that's coming from the department level. Um, for example, as chair of the education department, we started in the fall um, a, a departmental book club, right? And it was a way for us to maintain community with one another, getting together and to not talk so much about teaching, but to read a text that is related to our discipline and just engage with each other differently. We also have continued our tradition of having monthly or end of the block kind of social hangouts. We just do them virtually now. Um, and we've actually been much more intentional about checking in on one another, whether it's text, email, phone calls. Um, and so in many ways, I think we are, we have stepped up for one another as a faculty to really engage in that kind of social and emotional well-being. So Pedro, let me ask you to talk about what we can expect in the coming months with regard to virtual learning and our academic calendar. Absolutely. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things about, you know, being able to teach in different formats and, and, and teaching in this sequential way, right, that the block uh, offers us is that we can actually look at the data and try to and follow, you know, what, what's happening in terms of in terms of course formats, right? Is it, it is there an appetite for more in-person in instruction, or there isn't, right, and so forth? And what we're seeing actually now is that, and I can give you some numbers, is that for example, in blocks five and six, uh, if you take the number of uh, courses that were teach that that are being taught in in-person or a hybrid format, which has uh, uh, 
in-person component, that number is about 10% of all classes, right? From blocks five and six. When you go to actually then block seven, that number goes to 21%. When you go to block eight, it goes to 33%, right? So we, and then when you get to the summer, right, you get to about 40 to 45% of courses being taught in that particular format, right? So, so you can start to see that there's more of an appetite, right, for us to be able to start teaching, you know, with more in-person components in our classes. And that's great for us to gear up, right, for next semester, where the expectation is, right, that, that we'll be in person, right? Of course, assuming that, you know, the vaccines, you know, outpace the variants and so forth, right? But we are, we are hopeful, right, and optimistic that we'll be able to offer the majority of our courses, you know, next fall in, the, uh, um, in, in, in an in-person format and still retain some of the positive aspects, which are many of the, this experiment, right, of, of being able to teach, you know, remotely. So I think it's going to be a very exciting, exciting year. And, and, and what we're seeing now is kind of this gearing up to trying to go back to, to a year that's somewhat more normal. Professor Whitaker, you've earned the reputation of being a, a dedicated and stellar teacher. I'd love to hear some of your reflections about this past year. As Pedro has said, we are certainly moving to a fall where we'd be in person, but I'd love to, to know what you've learned from your day-to-day -day teaching experience during COVID and are there any things that you'll take forward as we go back in person? Absolutely. I think transitioning to virtual learning has really helped me define myself as an instructor, as a pedagogue, as a teacher. Um, I think usually in person, we can show up and rely on our content knowledge um, and some pedagogical skill to get us through the three hours. But when you're teaching in this format, you have to make some decisions ahead of time. Mm. You have to decide what content am I going to focus on? What is most important for my students? How am I going to make certain that they get that information? Um, because in person, I can look at them. I can look at all of them. I can read their body language and say, oh, President Edmonds, I don't think that you're following what I'm saying. You look confused. Let's go back. Um, but virtually, we can't do that as easily. Um, it's much more difficult to scroll through 27 video screens than to glance around the classroom. And so really being challenged to create summative and formative assessments that really get at the, 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 the key learning objectives has been a professional challenge that I very much have welcomed. Um, and additionally, I just think that in, in moving to this, this format, I've been really able to put boundaries around my workday. Um, it's easy when you come in person to get here at 7.30 and to leave at 5.30 because there's always work to be done. Um, but in this format, you know, I get up, I'm able to work out before class. I can actually eat breakfast. I still arrive early and stay late to class to chat with students. You know, I attend all my meetings in the afternoons, but it's easier to get up and walk away from my laptop to take a, a quick walk outside at 3 p.m. or to end my day officially at 5 p.m. than it is when I'm here in person. And so I am hoping to take those boundaries with me moving forward. Well, thank both of you for joining us today and also to remind us of the importance of self-care as we take care of others during uh, this transition to COVID and now out of COVID back to in-person. The two of you are remarkable teachers and members of our faculty and dedicated to our students and Robert and I just really wanted to thank you for what you've been doing and for your time today. Be well.